happen to look up and see this 155 millimetre high explosive artillery round that was coming straight for us. Kiam is a very small base, it's only about the size of a tennis court, so a really tiny position. And it's situated at the junction of the three countries of Israel, Lebanon and Syria. The base itself was actually surrounded by three Hezbollah bases, and the closest of these bases was located only 75 metres from us. The Hezbollah are a resistance force and they oppose the existence of Israel. So on the 12th of July 2006, uh, I was working on patrol base Kiam when the Hezbollah ambushed an Israeli Humvee patrol down on the border of Israel and Lebanon. And during that ambush, that attack, uh, the Hezbollah killed three Israeli soldiers and they captured two soldiers which they took back into southern Lebanon. And this is what sparked the 2006 war. And for us back at patrol base Kiam, uh, moments after that attack, we started to see Israeli fighter jets, their F-15 and F-16 fighter jets, in the air and systematically taking out uh, and bombing Hezbollah bases around us. Oh, whoa! Impact! Large impact! Aerial bomb! Now these bombs can effectively destroy sort of a 15-storey building. It's coming around again. Flares, flares. Flares, I gather flares. he's coming into here, I reckon. Yeah. And I was on the rooftop at the time with my teammates and I just happened to be looking south as this massive bomb came flying past me, really only at about eye level from me, uh, at the most 30 metres away from me. And I guess I, I had just got a sense that, uh, that, I, that I was going to die in this, in this war. And it felt like I could even put my hand out and touch this bomb as it was coming past us. And I can still visualise those stabilising fins off the back of this projectile as it came so close to us on its way to impact into that Hezbollah bunker. And uh, the blast from the, the rocket hitting the position actually came over the platform here where I'm standing now. When it did impact, uh, I just had enough time to tell my teammates to get down as this, this fireball, the blast wave, literally came over the top of us on patrol base Kiam, and there was a huge amount of shrapnel that actually came into our base because there was no overhead protection uh, on the rooftop where we were observing from. I'm talking huge pieces of concrete with steel star pickets twisted through the centre of these large chunks of uh, shrapnel that came whizzing by us, flying by our heads uh, on the rooftop and impacting into patrol base Kiam itself. This bomb impacting a mere 75 metres from us, it was an absolute miracle that we didn't take casualties there and then. Dead still in there. Israel had all the coordinates, the 10 figure uh, GPS coordinates, for all the UN bases uh, in Lebanon. And patrol base Kiam had been there, uh, had been established for over 30 years uh, in that location. So the war continued and it was going by day and night. There was artillery barrages, um, tank fire, attack helicopters, fighter jets, and also the Hezbollah responding to these Israeli assets uh, using Katusha rockets. My um, closest near miss came on night two of the war when patrol base Kiam was in the thick of an Israeli artillery barrage. And I was actually running to the bunker with my teammate Wolf uh, when I happened to look up and see this um, 155 millimetre high explosive artillery round that was coming straight for us.
We were completely exposed because we were unarmed and we were simply running to the bunker and we had no protection around us. And this round landed uh, 15 or 20 metres it impacted in front of Wolf and I as we were running to the bunker. But thankfully for us, um, the round had a partial ignition. Um, the, the high explosive canister did ignite and it split the, uh, the thick steel shell of the, the casing of the artillery round into three pieces. Um, but it was only sort of in the next day, in daylight, that we really understood exactly how close we'd come to, to dying and that um, the canister was still smouldering. It was about three quarters full of gunpowder. There'd been that partial ignition, but had that igni ignited as it should have, then that whole uh, shell casing should have been split into uh, 2,000 hot pieces of shrapnel that at 15 or 20 metres range, um, we would have been probably killed right then and there. I was tasked to command the convoy of two UN armoured personnel carriers and uh, a crew of 16 Indian and Ghanaian soldiers. And to command that convoy from patrol base Kiam through to the headquarters in Tia. We took um, cover overnight at a UN base called 9-1, which was basically about halfway between patrol base Kiam and Tia, uh, because we had had a near miss from a Hezbollah Katusha rocket, which was uh, fired into Israel, but it only narrowly missed my vehicle. At the most, it was five metres as it uh, skimmed over the windscreen and, and the roof of my vehicle as it headed into Israel. By the afternoon of day two of this transit, uh, the situation had really deteriorated in southern Lebanon, and Israel had commenced its ground invasion into Lebanon. And as a result, the roads that I had been tasked to take, that had been agreed by both the UN and Israel for me to take uh, a particular route, um, those roads had actually been destroyed by Israeli fighter jets in their bombing runs. Well, we're going to have to turn around because uh, um, the road's been taken out here with a bomb. But it was on the outskirts of the city of Tia that I got the news from my headquarters that uh, Israel was about to conduct the largest aerial bombardment of the city of Tia and the road that we were currently on was one of the roads that was going to be targeted during this airstrike. It was a, a very high pressure stress situation and, uh, and I was just hoping that we'd have enough time uh, to get this convoy through and that we could all survive. And I was, uh, my mind was actually flashing back to this situation in the bunker of patrol base Key Arm where I'd, I'd had this experience or this feeling that uh, I wasn't going to survive. And I, I guess my mind was also thinking, you know, is this the moment uh, that I had sort of had this premonition of my own death? Um, is it now that, that that moment's about to eventuate? Uh, I was informed that the Israeli fighter jets were in the air, they were actually on their way in on this bombing run, and at any moment I should expect to see uh, bombs impacting around us. So I was given approval to actually make a high-speed dash through the city of Tyr and try and make it to our UN headquarters on the other side of the city prior to this airstrike actually eventuating. And you can imagine there was quite a lot of chaos on the roads. There were civilian drivers also trying to, to reach shel shelter. So it was quite panicked and, and chaotic driving on the roads. And uh, there's no seat belts in these particular UN vehicles. I was on the phone uh, to my headquarters at the time and didn't foresee that my driver was about to take some evasive manoeuvring. And when he hit the, hit the brakes really hard, I was actually thrown forward into the bulletproof windscreen of my armoured vehicle, uh, fracturing and crushing five vertebrae in my back. Uh, I was in significant pain, but I knew I had bigger issues on, on my hands other than my own injury, because the Israeli airstrike was inbound and I needed to get the convoy rolling. So 
We did get to get going again and at about 15 or 20 minutes later we arrived at the UN headquarters. But it was once I got into the city of Tyr uh, that I found out that um, the UN medical evacuation systems had failed. Uh, basically they had a plan where they'd use their UN helicopters to medically evacuate seriously injured. Um, but they refused to use their helicopters due to the aerial bombardments and the threats. It was too dangerous to use the helicopters. So. The UN had to come up with an alternative plan and during that time they simply left me on a tiled floor for two days without morphine. I was very fortunate that I had um, reunited in, in the headquarters of Ntia uh, with my boyfriend Clint, uh, my Australian boyfriend who had um, just come into Lebanon to actually go on holidays with me. Had I come off the base on day two of the war, as was scheduled. So at least I had Clint with me, um, who was an absolute godsend uh, during that period. But during that two days, obviously without any pain relief, I was in a lot of pain. Um, and I'd started to have numb, tingling sensations in my arms and legs. And uh, I was completely incapacitated. I would need assistance to walk and, and move to the bathrooms. And I was certainly starting to worry about long-term effects of uh, particularly the, the numb, tingling sensations as, as to exactly what type of damage I had sustained to my spine. When I arrived in Cyprus and was in hospital there, uh, I received the tragic news uh, of the fate of my teammates back at patrol base Kiam, who'd remained behind to man that base. Uh, on the 25th of July, my teammates had reported nearly 100 um, aerial bombs going into the town of uh, El Kiam and almost nearly 100 uh, artillery shells that had come in, in three waves of attack by Israel. And during that six hour period, my teammates themselves at patrol base Kiam had sustained four direct hits from artillery. And one of these artillery shells had actually hit the bunker door. Um, and my teammates at that stage uh, had requested from the UN evacuation from the base because they felt it was no longer safe to remain there when the bunker door had now been jammed. Unfortunately, uh, the UN's um, evacuation um, came too late for my teammates uh, because about half an hour later, uh, an Israeli fighter jet uh, delivered a 1,000 pound uh, aerial bomb, which was a direct hit on the bunker of patrol base Kiam, where my teammates were taking shelter. And this instantly killed all four of my teammates. For me, it just seemed so surreal. The whole situation, um, it just wouldn't register in my mind as actually a real event and that my teammates, who I really considered like brothers rather than just colleagues, uh, could have perished in this war when the UN should never have been a target. It was real mixed emotions uh, when I eventually reunited uh, with my family. Uh, obviously a very teary uh, emotional situation, but it was sort of um, feeling quite torn as well, having known that uh, four of my colleagues had died. And, and I guess even in those early stages, I was really suffering from survivor guilt. Um, three of my four teammates who were killed all had children. And uh, so in many ways, I felt quite guilty of the fact that I had managed to survive, but my teammates hadn't. I had survived so many near misses on patrol base Kiam, and then also during that transit where at any stage a Katusha rocket, a thousand pound bomb from a fighter jet could have killed us, but yet I was injured inside an armoured vehicle um, in what was really a vehicle accident uh, through the streets of Tia. But in many ways, I'm very lucky that the injuries could have been far worse. I'm very lucky that uh, I wasn't killed and, I, and that I'm not in a wheelchair, that I am mobile. 
There are far, far more veterans out there that have much worse and significant injuries than I've sustained, so I'm very lucky.